You've got to be really clear with the generation above and the generation below that anxiety, the cult leader, is not dictating your family's behavior. So it means that you have to do all the things that we talk about all the time, is that how do you make sure that you are helping your kids tolerate uncertainty, be uncomfortable, step into new situations. You've got to be very clear with your kids that anxiety is not in charge of the family. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Robin. What are we going to talk about today? I think we're going to talk about cults. Yeah, we do talk about the cult of anxiety. The cult of anxiety. Yeah, we're going to talk a little more specifically about it. Because, you know, one of the things I say all the time is that anxiety is like a cult leader. The reason it's like a cult leader is because it comes in, it takes over your family, and then you want to do what the cult leader says because it makes things go more smoothly, right? If you're in a cult, and you listen to the cult leader, things go pretty okay. What happens when you want to get out of the cult, when you don't listen to the cult leader, that's when things get a little bumpy, to say the least. So we're going to talk about being in the cult. We're going to talk about getting out of the cult. And we're even going to talk about what happens when you decide to get out of the cult and other people around you are not so appreciative of your desertion. Yeah, I know. I'm sure there are all these stages. Interestingly, I bet cult specialists would say there's a lot of parallel. Anxiety really is a cult leader. We did an episode on college roommates. So this was a perfect example where there was a college roommate who had severe anxiety and OCD, and she was rooming with a Fluster Clux listener's child. And that roommate started telling her what she could and could not do, could and could not say, who she could be friends with and who she couldn't. And there was no self-awareness at all with Debbie's family of understanding that they are accommodating Debbie so much that they've kind of lost touch with reality in a way. And also, just to continue a theme, how we keep dating ourselves. Oh, gosh. And Seinfeld, Sex in the City, and Flashdance. Just for the record, Robin, there is no current college student named Debbie. There's nobody in college living in a dorm named Debbie. Nobody. <laughs> yeah. <You know. laughs> Can I tell you something? When I said that name in my head, I pictured the mom from that 70s show. <laughs> yeah, right. Again, there we go again. <laughs> okay, so there's this girl named Caitlin. Yeah, there we go. You're exactly correct. And this is what I see all the time. Now, I will tell you that it is incredibly satisfying when a family comes to see me or I'm doing a talk and I introduce this concept. And some people haven't liked this concept. Some people have pushed back against this concept because they say that it's too scary like if you're working with young kids, the idea of a cult leader. And I tend to be like, okay, so you're just being too literal and maybe you're a little nervous that I'm talking about like, oh my God, cults, right? It's okay. But it's very satisfying when a family hears this and then they begin to recognize what's going on. It's just a way to understand how powerful this thing has been in their family and how hard it is to get out of a cult. I mean, there are people who specialize in this, right? Like going and getting people out of cults and trying to deprogram them. And really, that's a lot of what I'm doing with families because this thing is so generational that it gets passed down in a way that families are just doing these patterns without that self-awareness that you talk about. What we want to think about is when somebody who has been a part of this for a long time when they decide that they're going to change their patterns or change their reactions, or they're not going to abide by the rules of the cult leader, 
it is really hard to find a different path sometimes because it's very unfamiliar. I mean, I would imagine in families, there are a lot of analogies of a family where somebody's never gone to college before. And so now somebody's going to make that move or a family that's run the family business. There's been a family business for years and somebody decides they're going to leave the family business and go to art school or go to culinary school. It is really hard when you are in a family that does things in a certain way to then announce to everybody that you're not going to play along. You're not going to follow along. Well, and that also could trickle down to the most mundane because that's actually where it's more common, right? It's more common where you have referenced families that in order to keep things running smoothly, there's one restaurant they can dine out in because that's the one restaurant that has the one dish that the picky eater will eat. So you accommodate by going to that one restaurant. That's the cult leader there telling everyone where they have to eat. So consistency is one thing. And then the other thing that came up recently in our Facebook group is we talked about, again, anxiety wants everything really serious. They want it serious. And that's why you always talk about play and humor and everything as a way to bring in a different energy. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't abide by these rules, there's going to be a price to pay. And what's interesting too is when people are in the cult of anxiety and they're doing what the cult leader wants, it becomes very normalized. Oftentimes people will tell me, I mean, I will say to families, well, knowing this, I've sort of presented this to you. What do you guys do in order to manage the worry, to manage the anxiety? And they will very offhandedly say, oh, well, we only go to one restaurant or we make sure that blah, blah, blah. Or like we were talking about in the sports episode, oh, well, we just make sure that nobody's allowed to bring their dogs to soccer practice. Like they announce these things as if they're normal. Like, of course, we've only eaten at one restaurant for 10 years, or of course, we are not allowed to play this certain music, or of course, we're not allowed to talk about this topic. I mean, there are some families I've worked with where you are not allowed to say the word anxiety in the family. And they'll say to me, they'll come in to see me and they'll say, well, we can talk about this, but we're not allowed to say the word anxiety. And they just sort of accept that that's the way it is. I don't know if this is the professional term, but these are accommodations. Correct. These are accommodations. And the role of an accommodation is to make sure that things go smoothly when we're talking about anxiety, because there are a lot of accommodations we put in place for other things. But the role of an accommodation is to make sure that things go smoothly. People just sort of begin to kind of accept. I've talked to families where they don't drive over bridges because one person in the family is afraid of bridges, or they don't go to the movies, or they don't do this, or they don't do that. And if you think about kids raised in families, what a child perceives as normal is really just what has been talked about and what has been done in their family. And oftentimes somebody gets out of the cult, right? It's, I mean, like literally imagine you get out of a cult and you're like, oh my gosh, people don't wear buns everywhere. But it's this idea that you step out into the world and suddenly realize that there are far more options available to you. And that's the freeing part of getting out of the anxiety cult. But it is not often a smooth exit, for sure. I was talking with a friend about this, because you always talk about have goals in therapy. To be able to articulate what your family culture is and what was unique to your family, so that you acknowledge that may or may not have been normal. This is how we talked about this. This is how we behaved around this. And to understand what that family culture was and whether or not it's worth perpetuating or disrupting. Yeah. And the word cult and culture are the same root. So when we come back, let's talk about just making sure that we're not in a cult. And then what do we do when we realize we are? Okay. So a lot of people think that seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist would be helpful, but they're intimidated by the price, by the time that it actually takes to find one, to meet with them. Talkspace offers you the opportunity to do everything online, and it's really made getting the help you want easy 
accessible, and affordable. With Talkspace, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you within about 48 hours. It's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your home because there's no need to commute to appointments, miss time at work, or line up childcare in order to attend your sessions and keep them regular. It's mental health care made easy. And we want people to take advantage of it because we want people to be preventative. So as a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. Match with a licensed therapist today. Go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. This episode is brought to you by Trumetta. It's a premium supplement company based out of California that strives to make self-care easy. One of their great products is mushroom coffee. It is a must for your morning routine and it tastes delicious. It has no mushroom aftertaste, only the benefits that mushrooms bring. And this organic premium coffee blend has lion's mane mushroom for productivity, reishi mushroom for immune support, cordyceps to boost your energy, and of course, caffeine to give you the kick that you need every day. Yeah, we need that caffeine. So start your 2024 healthier with True Meta Mushroom Coffee and see for yourself how it helps you to focus so you can get stuff done. You'll feel an uptake in your productivity every time you drink it. Trumetta offers their best deal to Fluster Clux fans. You'll get a free electric mixer and 40% off the coffee plus free shipping in the U.S. So go right now to trumetta.com slash fluster to fuel your productivity and creativity with some delicious mushroom coffee. That's T-R-U-M-E-T-A dot com slash fluster. I'm always trying to think about how I can improve my health and feel better. And Thrive Market is one of the ways which is really helpful because they have filters that let me choose the things that are good for my health. For example, I'm really working on eating less meat these days, and they have vegetarian and vegan filters that bring products right in front of me. It makes it easy to shop and easy to choose. Thrive Market's my go-to for all my grocery and pantry needs and my household essentials. I get everything online and then I get it quickly shipped to my door and it's a huge time saver. I love those filters. Maybe you're looking for organic kid snacks or maybe your family is gluten-free. You can save money on every single grocery order and on average, I save over 30% each time. And they even have a deals page that changes daily, and it always includes at least one of my favorite brands. Yeah, like 7th Generation. That's a really great brand that I use. When you join Thrive Market, you're also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join, they give. Join in all the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks. Thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, we're back. When we're thinking about a cult, right? Remember, we're thinking about a group in which there are very rigid, strict rules about what's accepted and what's not accepted. And so if you are in this cult, if your family culture is a certain way, and then you decide you're going to break the rules, you are betraying what has been accepted practice for a very long time. For example, If you have a family where the culture is very much into drinking and you decide that you are not going to drink, you will get blowback from that. People will roll their eyes at you and they'll say things like, oh, you're so much better than us, I guess. It happens in so many different ways. When a family has been a worried family for a long time, the culture of the family is often that worrying means caring. So if you are worrying, if you are talking about what is going to go wrong, if you are making sure that the highly anxious people don't have to suffer any consequences, and that's the way your family operates, then when you decide that you're not going to play that game anymore, there's going to be some blowback. 
and those words that those families say all the time, I just want you to be safe. I just want you to be happy. I just want things to go okay, right? It's like from this lens of concern is I just don't want you taking any risks. Right. I just want to make sure that everything goes okay. I'm just looking out for your well-being. I'm only thinking of you. And that's not true. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I get it. It feels that way. Say you're in a family and there's one person who's particularly anxious. That person is going to use strategies or use language, use tactics to convince you to stay in the cult. And that language that you're explaining, that language that you're giving as examples is exactly correct, right? And then they will say things like, if you're going to be that risky, or even if you're going to be that stupid, or if you're going to be that fill in the blank, I guess that just means that you don't care about the rest of us. So basically, you're going to poison our anxious cult with reckless, unsafe, uncertain, uncomfortable behavior and demands. So it is very compelling in a family that has an anxious culture to keep doing the things that the anxious culture demands because people bring out a lot of the heavy emotional weaponry to pull you back in. The majority of families have some level of anxious culture. I would say that your family, I've observed it. I mean, you walk the walk and you talk the talk, but you've also had 30 plus years of practice incorporating this that most people don't. There's kind of like you on one side and everybody else on the other, (laughs) you know, a varying degree. So I just want to mention that. I mean, it's not like there's a ton of families who don't have anxious cultures because this is really relevant to most families at some level. For sure. And it's not like I don't worry. When I handed my kids the car keys, it's not like I don't worry about my kids. Of course you do. You just have a more practiced response of how you handle that where the anxiety isn't leading your conversation. Well, and the other thing is that I do not feel that it's my children's job to manage my worry. If they are doing something in a reasonable way that also has some risk to it, it is not my job to take my worry as a mom and say, you can't do this thing because I'm worried about it. That's the hardest thing is that I can feel the worry and keep my mouth shut. Right. So my son broke his elbow in two places and he's better, but he just broke it a little while ago, but it's better. And then he says he's going to go snowboarding. Okay. So do I want him to go snowboarding with a freshly healed elbow? No, I would rather he not go snowboarding, but I am not going to say to him, I am so worried about you going snowboarding. What if you fell and hurt your arm again? That would be terrible. You wouldn't be able to work, blah, 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 blah. So what I say instead, I say, so you got the go-ahead that you can snowboard? And he says, yeah, the doctor and the PT said, if I wear my brace and I go, I'm okay. And I'm like, all right, well, that's great. I'm so glad you're getting back to your normal life. And then on the inside, I'm like, please don't fall on your elbow. But I don't demand that he listen to my worry and change his behavior based on my worry. Because it was a reasonable decision based on all the information about his elbow. Well, that sounds like a great conversation and it's really instructive. What if he had said to you, I haven't gotten the go ahead, but I'm sure it'll be fine. And I know that's not really who your son is, but how would you have handled that if that had been the case instead? I think I would have said, I know you really want to go snowboarding. I just want you to think this through because the thing we say to my kids all the time when they were growing up is think one step ahead. So I just want you to make sure you're factoring in a lot more than your desire to go snowboarding right now. If you fall and hurt your elbow, this time it won't be a workman's comp case. Your decision, but think one step ahead and just make sure that you're thinking about this rationally and responsibly rather than just based on the absolute understandable desire that it's fun to go snowboarding with your friends. Sorry to make this show about you and your family, but this is actually quite interesting to me. You just gave an example. Would you have not said the second answer anyway? Did you feel like you had to just kind of zip it because he got a professional approval? Yeah, yeah. No, I'll tell you, I could have gone either way. 
And maybe if we were talk to him, maybe he would be like, oh, I remember it differently, mom. You were clearly <laughs> concerned, right? He might say, I could see on your face that you were like really trying to be like, oh, good, have fun. And on the inside. That's very true. You're like, no, I was as cool as a cucumber and I should text him. So there are many, many times, and even though my kids are young adults now, where they are doing things that I'm sort of hoping go well. I mean, my son took off and drove across the country during COVID. I didn't know where he was. He would check in a little bit, but I think I told this story. I got a picture on my phone of my son in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania from my neighbor who ran into him in a restaurant and I had no idea he was in Pennsylvania. So there are a lot of times where I'm just like, okay. Yeah. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that I keep my mouth shut a lot. Now, if they are doing something stupid, if they are taking a risk that is really beyond the pale, I'm not going to keep my mouth totally shut. But it's that balance of, can I make sure that my understandable, but not necessarily required or welcomed worry be inserted into their decision making? And that's the hard part of parenting. Thank you for that. Because I think the rest of us sort of have to understand what our goals are, because the majority of us are caught in a varying degree of anxiety cult parenting focused on safety and focused on risk. The other place that I see it show up a lot is like in terms of achievement that we talk about a lot. You're making a decision where I really want you to study more for that test, or I really think that you should go back to that job interview, or I really think that you should follow up in that way. So there are things of safety and risk, but there are also things where we feel like they're just not following through in ways that will lead to more success or more achievement or better grades or better outcomes in some way. The cult of perfectionism. Right. And just the cult of let's maximize better outcomes, right? Let's just do whatever we can to maximize better outcomes. That's a really hard place to pull back from as well. The other thing too, I think that's really important to talk about is that if you have somebody in your family that's really anxious, so it might be a kid, but it might be a parent, is to really understand how often your family adjusts to your anxiety. How often your family doesn't do what it would want to do. How often your kid doesn't do something. How often your partner doesn't do something. How often does a kid not go to a event they want to go to or doesn't go to a college that's far away or doesn't go to a sleepover because the parent is anxious. And the way that the parent perceives that, the way the parent sells that is that you're just a good son or you're a good daughter because you're not upsetting me. You're not doing these things and it's just really important because it makes me feel better and that's a really good thing to do for this family. That's another way that the cult just sort of dictates behavior. That's so interesting you say that because just my own life experience, I had observed that the docile sibling that the parents often enjoy for those reasons aren't necessarily the mentally healthiest siblings. I observed that in some family that I'm close to, and that makes perfect sense now. Mm -hmm. You're being agreeable, and it's nice to be agreeable, but are you being agreeable because the anxiety cult leader is demanding or requesting this level of agreement? So you're going along with the cult leader. What happens in families like that is that kids and adults too don't really know what they really want or what they really like to do because they're really beholden to the cult leader. And the messaging is really powerful. And this is how human beings operate. This is not unique because we are social creatures. So the messaging from the culture really dictates a lot of the decisions we make. It takes a lot of courage to push back against the norms in your family, the culture in your family, the culture in your school, right? It takes a lot of courage to push back against that. If somebody's listening to this, right, and they've been listening for a while and they're like, oh, I recognize that I'm an anxious parent and I'm really going to do things differently. And that may mean letting your kids go to sleepovers or taking the tracking app off your kid's phone or letting them go on a camping trip by themselves or whatever feels risky in your family, I bet 
you got some blowback from your spouse or your mother or your aunt or your whatever, the people that are in the anxiety cult do not admire or value your decisions that move you out of the anxiety cult. They don't see those as good decisions. They see them as that you're being a traitor to the cult leader, that you're pushing back against the way we do things. And it takes a lot of courage to not be in the state of anxiety in the family of anxiety. Before we talk about getting out of the cult, I want to bring up a point that I love that you use in your work so much of the specificity of language and the tool that that provides. Because you're all about people having parts to themselves. And when anxiety is the cult leader, and it might be specifically attached to one member of the family, everyone is ganging up on the anxiety cult leader, not the member of the family. And that's why making anxiety be a part of you that you extract and pull out and talk to. That's also why like the cult leader that everyone's following, it shouldn't be personalized. The anxiety should be personified. Correct. And when, so if there's an anxious parent that says, oh, I really don't want to continue this generationally. I don't want to be in this anxious family anymore, or I don't want to support this anxious culture anymore. So we're going to pull the anxiety out. We're going to give it a name. We're going to talk about the cult leader in a way that creates that separation. And that's really effective, like you say, because then one person doesn't feel attacked. It's not like you're demeaning that person. The flip side of that is when the anxious person doesn't acknowledge their anxiety and they say that thing that drives me crazy, which is, well, this is just how I am, or this is just who I am. And then there's no separating the anxiety cult leader from the person because they're in a very tight relationship. So that's what you want to pay attention to. If you've got a family member that's saying, well, I'm sorry, this is just the way I am and I'm not going to do anything about it, you don't have to attack them personally, but then you have to start changing your behavior so that you're not doing the accommodating, you're not doing the anxious behavior, and they are not going to be happy with you. If you're talking about your family to somebody else and you use the phrase, well, this is just what we do, Mm -hmm. little red flag. Yeah, big red flag from my perspective. Yeah, there are bigger red flags in life. But yeah, when people say, well, this is just how we do things. Think of families that really struggle with substance abuse, which again, many, many families are dealing with that. And if you've got somebody who is using substances, you've got somebody who's drinking alcoholically and you're trying to help them have a look at their behavior or to see how much the family has to accommodate it. And they say, well, you know what? This is just what we do in my family. You know what? This is what we do. This is how we are. This is what we do. It's such a demoralizing message for other people to hear because what they're basically saying is, I am not going to do anything to help make this change happen. And you've got to accept that oftentimes. The person who wants to stay in the cult is going to stay in the cult. That's the bottom line. And so the goal is, how do you and whoever else in your family wants to get out of the cult, how do you get them out of the cult? How do you support getting out of the cult, accepting that maybe grandma's going to stay in the cult? Maybe your partner's going to stay in the cult. Maybe your mother is going to stay in the cult. And how do you respond differently and what are you modeling for your kids? Let's take a break and we'll come right back. Hey, Lynn, wouldn't you say that it's almost as important to raise financially literate kids as it is emotionally intelligent kids? Of course, because I'm always talking about the big skills that we want our kids to have, decision-making, autonomy, being able to step in the world independently, and starting early, giving kids the opportunity to learn how to manage their money and make good financial decisions. It's a great idea. So we have a lifesaver recommendation you need to check out called Greenlight. Greenlight's a debit card and money app made for families, and it gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy, and it gives parents a peace of mind. Yeah, you can do things like send instant money transfers. You can automate allowance. You can also keep an eye on your kids' spending with real-time notifications. Kids can begin their journey toward financial autonomy, and you know how I love autonomy, by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. The app includes a chores feature where you can set up recurring or one-time chores customized to your family's needs, and you can reward kids for a job well done. And this is a game changer because otherwise, in the old days, 
days, we would ask them to do the chores. We would try and track it. Maybe they didn't always get paid for what they had done. Then there was a disagreement about, did you pay me for this or that? And then like the love of chores went away really fast. It's about consistency and it's about helping parents teach their kids these valuable skills that set them up for success in the future. So six million parents and kids are learning about money on Greenlight. It's the easy, convenient way to get kids on the right financial path. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash fluster. That's greenlight.com slash fluster to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash fluster. You know, Robin, in the new year, people have resolutions and a big one is to save money. Stop shopping without getting anything in return. You can actually start getting cash back on every purchase you make with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies to toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $145 a year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip or even buy you a flight to somewhere amazing. Other apps will give you points that don't really amount to too much. With Ibotta, just add your offers in the app, upload your receipt, and you get real cash. Cash that goes into your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Join over 50 million savers and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code FLUSTER when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use the code FLUSTER. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use the code FLUSTER. Okay, so now back to the show. Okay, Lynn, let's talk about anxiety cult extraction. Deprogramming. Yeah, deprogramming, right? That's what they call it. Yeah. So let's just say that you have been listening to this podcast or you're learning about anxiety. It's hitting you right between the eyes, right? Or you're reading the anxiety audit. It was funny. I was at a school recently and they just did a book club of the anxiety audit. And I said, how'd you guys like it? They're all like, we all feel terrible (laughs) because we all do these things. And I was like, yeah, that's the point of the book. You shouldn't feel terrible that you're discovering more about yourself. Don't feel terrible. Yeah. I said, well, I hope that you moved from feeling terrible to feeling like you're part of the crowd because welcome, right? We all do these patterns and now you have so much more information. So you've sort of decided like, all right, I'm going to break this pattern. I'm not going to do this anymore. So the way you extract yourself, you've got a few choices. One is that you can let the other anxious people and maybe the person who's sort of the family cult leader, you can let them know directly that you're really working on changing this pattern. Okay. Now it depends on the person. Maybe they'll say, oh, you know what? I am so proud of you. I could never do this, Debbie, but you go right ahead and do it. But maybe it's better for you not to announce what you're doing to the anxiety cult leader in your family. Maybe it's something that you're just going to do on your own. Maybe in your immediate family, your nuclear family, you're just going to start to make those changes. And the way you do that is that you start paying attention to accommodation. You start paying attention to the rules that have been in place in your family, sometimes for a really long time, that you are no longer going to follow. And again, you can let somebody know that you're not going to follow those rules, or you can simply by example, or simply by your own choosing, stop obeying them. What might that look like? Maybe the anxious person in the family says, well, you know how I feel about you driving at night. And so if you're going to come over to our house, you have to make sure that you're home by the time it gets dark out because you know how much I worry about that. And then at that point, you can say, if you choose, you can say, you know what? I'm really working on breaking some of those fears and breaking some of those worries. And I drive at night all the time. I'm going to come and visit you, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave when we decide that the visit is over, not when you're 
anxiety or the anxiety decides the visit is over. So you can be that direct about it. Now, what do you think is going to happen? I was about to say, yeah, that's not going to go well. Right. So the person is going to be angry. The person is going to be disappointed. The person might use that guilt, might use, you know, call you careless and reckless, say, you don't care about me. Why would you want to put me through this? You know, I'm just going to worry about you. And if you are pulling out of this, if this really is your goal, then you're going to have to tolerate that person being upset with you because the way the anxiety continues is through people being upset and people not wanting to feel uncomfortable and not wanting to rock the boat and not wanting to push back against it. If you have a relationship with this person that you can say, I get that your worry and your anxiety are really powerful, but I want to see if I can do things differently. And I totally get this is hard for you, but this is about me doing things differently and your worry, your anxiety is not going to be happy with me. And I'm sorry for that. I love you, but I'm not going to keep doing what your worry wants me to do. And the really great thing is that, say you're a parent and you've got kids, and maybe it's your mom or your dad or your sibling or somebody else, even your partner that's been in the worry cult and you're pulling out, let your kids know what your intent is. Because they know who the anxious parent is in the family. They know who the anxious grandparent is in the family. I say this all the time, never, ever in the history of Lynn Lyons doing this job for 34 years have I asked a kid, who's the anxious parent? And the kid's like, I don't know. That's a good question. They always know. They are very clear about who the worriers are. So if you say to your kids, we're not going to follow the rules of the anxiety cult leader, we're pulling ourselves out of this cult, I think they're going to be kind of glad about that. And it's your opportunity to model responding and reacting in a different way. And as I say, modeling is really just the primary thing that you can do differently in your family. Well, in that scenario, it was almost like the cult leader was coming from maybe a grandparent, for example. Yep. We've gotten a listener question recently where very much you have this scenario in the couple that the mom said she's really trying to work on this. And she's been very disappointed that her partner kept saying, this is just who I am. This is just who I am and isn't willing to play here. So that's a little trickier. What's your advice there? It is a little trickier. And I hate that phrase. And if somebody says that to me in my office, I call them right out on it. I think in that situation, you are going to have to be consistent The reason that people don't push back against that or the reason that people sort of get stuck in that is they really feel like they're going to put the relationship at risk. They're afraid the marriage is going to end. They're afraid that the partnership is going to get even rockier or maybe than it already is. And the fact of the matter is, is that it could. It really could. When you decide not to continue patterns that you have recognized as unhealthy or harmful, not everybody is going to go along with it. So there is some risk in that. I think that what I would say to a spouse, a partner that says, well, that's just who I am, the response is, I don't think that either of us should accept this pattern, this cult leader, this culture is okay when it's not. And I am going to work really hard to not be a part of it. And I really want you to join me in learning about it, but I can't force you. So it's the same if you had a partner that was using something addictively, right? You had a partner who was addicted to alcohol or addicted to another drug. You would say to them, I am not going to continue to raise our children or have a marriage in which this pattern is dictating our lives. I'm going to do what I can to learn about it, and I invite you to join me, but I can't force you to join me. That's a really scary thing to say. The other thing, too, though, is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So if you've got a partner who's anxious and they're working on it, so they haven't said to you, well, that's just the way I am, which, again, annoys me, and they say, oh, but this is so hard for me. How am I possibly going to do it? You can say to them, I'm going to model for you how to get out of the cult. And whenever you feel like you want to join me, whenever you feel like you can sort of grab my hand and we'll do this together, I so welcome you joining me. And you can do this and I'm going to support you. 
imagine you're in the cult and I'm sort of reaching my hand into you and I'm just going to grab your hand and pull you out. I'm here to help you get out of the cult, even though it's really hard. So that sometimes can feel like a more loving and supportive way of doing it. If you have somebody who's sort of like, oh, I want to do it, but it's hard versus somebody who's like, I'm not talking about this. Right. And if they're not talking about this, then wouldn't you recommend that the spouse who's trying to get out of it, a therapist helping them really build boundaries along the way would make this a little easier because this would be very hard to do by yourself. Really hard to do by yourself. You know, whenever you're trying to change a pattern, whenever you're trying to hold the line, whenever you're trying to get out of a family pattern, oftentimes it's really helpful to have somebody who's supporting you in that and somebody saying, yep, stay the course, stay the course. Yeah. And sometimes couples go to therapy. You know, we just did that great episode with my friend, Michelle, where she talked about differences doesn't mean that a marriage can't work. But if a person is demanding that their culture be the only culture, then it makes it much harder to be a part of. So Lynn, one final scenario that has come up a lot with our readers too, is that what if the cult leader is the child? So that's probably... Highly typical of what we hear about and highly typical of what comes into my office. Because a lot of times when families come into my office, they're coming in because their kid is having trouble. And then I'm the one who sort of like, is like, hey, guess what? It's not just the kid. But the same rules apply. And just as you started off this episode talking about the family that would only go to one restaurant or the family that was demanding that they only do this activity or don't bring the dogs to soccer practice or all that kind of stuff, same rules apply. It's actually easier when you start earlier. So as soon as you see this with your kids, the longer that your child has the impression, has the experience of being in charge, their cult leader being charged, the harder it is to break the pattern. If you've got a child who is younger and you're seeing this anxiety and you feel like your job is to accommodate the cult leader, I highly recommend that Whoever is raising that child, you guys work together to make sure that you start interrupting these patterns. And if you are in a family with a strong anxiety culture and you're seeing your child is really developing anxiety and there is a grandparent that is very anxious and is trying to thwart your efforts, I mean, I have grandparents come into therapy sessions all the time, so I can tell them like, look, this is what we're trying to do. But you've got to be really clear with the generation above and the generation below that anxiety, the cult leader, is not dictating your family's behavior. So it means that you have to do all the things that we talk about all the time, is that how do you make sure that you are helping your kids tolerate uncertainty, be uncomfortable, step into new situations? And that you are not turning to the anxiety and saying, what do you think we should do? Which restaurant should we eat at? Where should we go? You've got to be very clear with your kids that anxiety is not in charge of the family. And that takes work. Start early. It's never too late. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Ko, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, You'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.